Good evening. I call to order this meeting of the Washington County Board of Education. And we have all members present and the student representatives, so we do have a quorum. Board member Peter Bickford will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. time I'd like to have approval of this evening's agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of approval? Okay, we're unanimous. Student rep concurs. Agenda has been approved. We move to the approval of the minutes. Mrs. Williams, I move for the approval of the closed session minutes dated Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Gasford. Is there a second to second. Mr. Gasford's motion? Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the closed session of May 4th, 2021? All right, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approval? Okay, we're unanimous. Mrs. Williams, on the second uh, approval of the business meeting minutes dated Tuesday, May 4th, 2021, I make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Gessert. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Any additions or corrections? I have a minor edit on page 88. The third paragraph under board member comments, there is the word finding and it should be corrected to funding. Okay. So with that minor edit, there are no further additions or corrections. All those in favor of approval? Okay, we have unanimous approval and the student rep concurs. This time we'll have public comment. This, e this evening we have individuals who have signed up in advance. Each speaker is limited to five minutes if speaking for himself or herself or if representing a group or an organization. Mr. Bickford is our timekeeper. We'll have Mr. Jamie Myers come forward at this time. Mr. Myers is our first person to address the board. Good evening, Mr. Myers. Good evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak in front of you today. Uh, my name is Jamie Myers, and I come here as a concerned citizen, active PTA member, registered voter and most importantly, the loving father of three wonderful and talented daughters. As I monitor the dire situation that is the closure of Hancock High School, I am extremely discouraged and feel that, although well-intentioned, a decision of this magnitude will have a negative lasting impression on the children affected. I would like to provide you with a perspective that encompasses more than just numbers. <clears throat> As I watched the FIAC committee deliberate, I noticed that not many had a true understanding of the unique situation the Hancock community faces. They were presented with numbers and numbers alone were taken into consideration. Not young, impressionable lives, but numbers. We are a town seemingly removed from the majority of the county. I know some of you have ties with Hancock, have visited Hancock and were even educators. And for that, I thank you. I watched as the FIAC committee voted nine to one to recommend closure of Hancock High School, suggesting certain criteria be met. 
So those criteria included providing buses for after school activities, adding bus routes during a driver shortage, and therapy to help with any mental and emotional issues that children will absolutely need. Criteria that sounds reasonable and may justify this decision for some, but even the mere consideration of such suggests that this recommendation was not thoroughly thought through. During a time when mental illness is spotlighted across the nation, this very committee has voted nine to one to place unneeded emotional and mental strain on the children that we love. A burden that will ultimately affect our children's ability to adequately learn. We, parents and educators alike, are tasked with teaching and protecting our children. Children rely on their parents for support and they need their families. Not having them during the most impressionable years of their young life can cause lifelong lasting mental and emotional damage. I had a very brief conversation with a FIAC committee member as she sought me out on social media to try and discredit my statements. She stated, she stated that only Hancock aged children will be affected by this decision. This is absolutely false. A suggestion of opening Hancock Elementary 30 minutes early to accommodate the longer bus rides for high school students has been considered. My elementary aged daughter currently wakes up at 5.20 a.m. to board a bus at 6.08. Her bedtime is 8 p.m. and that allows her to receive the minimum amount of sleep considered healthy by medical professionals. She enjoys spending time with her siblings. Family is extremely important to her. Please tell, tell me how this will be beneficial to her and conducive to good learning behaviors. That's just one example, and I assure you there are hundreds. I've heard board members ask for letters from students expressing how much they love Hancock. It is not their job to save their school. As referenced previously, we, parents and educators, are tasked with providing for the well-being until adulthood. Our children should be worried about college, tech schools, and planning for their future. They shouldn't have the burden of this magnitude thrust on them and somehow assume responsibility for the potential closure of their school. This is yet another example of the mental hardships being poorly placed on Hancock students. This is not their fight, nor should it even be suggested. I watched from the board's very doorstep as the FIAC committee walked into this room and made the recommendation official. I watched as they struggled to answer or deflected many of the questions posed by the board members and the student representative. I watched as they touted representation from the Hancock community. I assure you, because someone lives within the borders of the community does not mean that they will suffer the same effects. I could go on and on, but the real truth of the matter is that the very individual who has had a child walk the halls of Hancock has had a child on the bus for long durations at Hancock schools, has the most knowledge of the school and how it operates, voted against the closure. That solitary vote, the one that has an understanding far exceeding the numbers and presentations, should speak volumes. Unfortunately, it seems to have been ignored. We should be asking why instead of blindly looking for justification. I've had conversations with each and every board member, and I hope this dialogue continues. I've expressed my concern time and again. Educational opportunities are referenced during every telephone call and I have stated that for years, programming has been taken from Hancock, most notably the wildly popular ag program. And now it is being used as justification for school closure. The most common response I receive is that the responsibility for programming falls on Dr. Boyd Michael. There is no logical reason the ag program could not have remained and been successful at Hancock. If I recall, the town offered to provide a plot of land for this program. If that isn't community support, I'm not sure what is. It has been stated many times that this recommendation isn't financial. However, it was suggested during several telephone conversations that pressure be placed on county commissioners to provide more funding for education. Our children will not serve as pawns in a political tug of war. In conclusion, I would like to relay to the board that the Hancock community is not looking for Hancock High to simply remain open. We are looking for long-term solutions we would like to provide opportunities at Hancock that could potentially benefit every child within the county. There are solutions that are simply being overlooked or worse, completely ignored. 
This seems like a very short-sighted solution with negative effects that our children may never overcome. This decision, this burden falls squarely on your shoulders, not our students, as some may suggest. The mental and emotional health of our students is worth far more than $1.5 million, or less than 1% of the board's annual budget. The mental and emotional health of our students is worth more than turf on a football field. The sound mental and emotional health of our children cannot be found on a two to four hour daily bus commute. For the majority, it's found in the comfort of their homes with the loving support of their families. To say the pros of closing Hancock High outweigh the cons is ignorant to the situations that many Hancock students and families face on a daily basis. I implore of you to take the time to to take the time to have a complete understanding of this and not to forget that the education is merely one piece of a children's life. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knight. This time we have Gabby Ryder and Hallie or Haley Vanover. I understand we have an additional student there. Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, five minutes. There's one speaker. Is is that correct? One person Two. speak. Two speakers. Yeah. So we each get five minutes. My understanding is that they were to speak together and that there were five minutes allocated. So when you have about 30 seconds left, I'll hold up the yellow and then red is to stop. <laughs> My name is Haley Vanover and we are here to advocate for teachers being at our graduation. We've seen the amazing work that teachers have been doing these past around 16 months. Truly, it's been one of the hardest times that our generation has faced and we'd see this as an opportunity for teachers be, to be able to celebrate for, with us in those final moments of our, of the culmination of our 13 years of education in WCPS schools. And we just want to say that we are so, so appreciative to all WC, WC, WCPS, excuse me, staff, administration, everyone for making this year as bearable as it possibly can be. And we thank you all for your amazing efforts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Tanish Gupta. Good evening. You have five minutes, and Mr. Bickford is our timekeeper. So, Linda, you have about 30 seconds left to hold up the yellow, and then five minutes is to stop. All right, thank you. The school system today has a problem. For the graduation, for the graduation of the class of 2022, teachers will not be allowed to observe the graduation. This is shocking. I know I speak for every teacher in the county when I say this is shocking. Graduation is a tradition, and a tradition that has not been broken for decades. In a year full of broken traditions, this decision is unnecessary. We praise our teachers for working through the pandemic, through virtual school, through an empty building, and through a hybrid classroom. Yet why do we stop at praise? Why not take action which teachers actually benefit from. And I, for the majority of the school year, this board has, 
dealt with situations out of their control. And I commend the adept handling of these situations in order to return to school in a safe manner. But this action contradicts what I believe is best for the Washington County school system. Teachers have worked impossibly to push students to graduate. Now they cannot even see them walk across the stage. It is a hard decision, giving up a day of learning to allow teachers to see their students graduate. But what is the alternative? Punish the teachers when they're, they have already gone through so much? Some of these teachers have dragged their students across the finish line, knowing that they will be able to see these students walk across that stage. But now, we're even taking that away from them. This decision is an insult to teachers, and I urge the board and the superintendent to come to a different decision. I understand that we want every day to be a day of learning, but a few hours of virtual education will not make up for a once in a year event, and in this case, a once in a lifetime event. Though there may be issues with attendance, having a half day on June 1st is the best solution. For everything our teachers have been through, I believe allowing them to come to the graduation is the least we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Okay, I have no one else on the list who have signed up in advance. Is there anyone else out there that, no? Okay, then that will conclude the public comment portion of our meeting. Board members, do any of you have a response that you would like to offer to comment? And we'll move to old business. President Williams, can I give a response? Certainly. I just wanted to commend the students out there who advocated, they expressed uh, their point of view, even if some may disagree or, sorry, even if some may disagree or agree with that statement, what they did here today is example of activism, advocating for what they believe in. And we, as the Board of Education, encourage people to come here and advocate, submit a public comment through email and also submit public comment if you would like to do so at the board meeting too. I just want to commend those students for going out of their comfort zone and advocating for an important cause. Thank you, Mr. Bakum. We have two items of old business this evening. First is consideration of the second reading of proposed changes to policy BDE, board member standing committees. Mrs. Ersprung. Good evening, Madam President, Dr. Michael, and board members. During the Board of Education's public business meeting on May 4th, the board approved the first reading of proposed changes to policy BDE, board member standing committees. The community was provided with an opportunity to provide comments on the proposed changes. We have not received any comments. At this time, the policy committee is requesting the approval of the second reading of this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ersprung. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the second reading and adoption of proposed changes to policy BDE entitled Board Member Standing Committees. Thank you, Mr. Bicker. Is there a second? <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer, for the second. Any questions or any discussion? I would just like to say that it's been almost 15 years since this policy was revised. And I think that the revisions provide clarity and direction for all. And for that, I am appreciative. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members, Mrs. Ersprung and Mrs. Brown, for their work on this policy. I think we have it nailed now. So thank you. Anyone else wish to comment or anything for discussion? We'll move to the vote. We're moving to approve the second reading and adoption of proposed changes to policy BDE entitled Board Member Standing Committees. All those in favor? Great, we're unanimous with the student member concurring. Next item under consideration is the second reading of the rescission of policy JOA, release of student records, and of proposed changes to policy JOB, student records. During the Board of Education's public business meeting on May 4th, 
The board also approved the first reading to rescind policy JOA, titled Release of Student Records, and the first reading of proposed changes to policy JOB, titled Student Records. The community was also provided with an opportunity to submit comments on the proposed rescission and changes. We have not received any comments. At this time, the policy committee is requesting the approval of the second reading of these policies. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ersprung. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the second reading and rescission of policy JOA entitled Release of Student Records and the second reading and adoption of proposed changes to policy JOB entitled Student Records. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zedmeyer. <clears throat> any questions or any discussion? I'd just like to note that this policy was adopted in April of 1977, 44 years ago. So the committee uh, took the opportunity to revisit this policy and to make updates using an equity lens. I think the updates reflect the importance of keeping and maintaining student records in accordance with the law. And I know that um, it was suggested perhaps that we have in regulations a definition for authorized representatives. So if we can make note of that. I know there was a question I think at our last meeting when we were doing the first read. So I think that would be helpful. Anything else? We'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approval. Okay, we have a unanimous vote with student member concurring. The motion carries. That concludes our old business. Thank you, Mrs. Ersprung. Under new business, our first item under consideration is the fiscal year 2021 budget adjustment with Mr. David Brandenburg, our executive director of finance presenting. Good evening, President Williams and members of the board and Dr. Michael. Uh, as you know, from time to time, we do bring forward uh, budget adjustments to cross categories between budget items. Uh, tonight, we bring just a few. The main thing is to transfer funds uh, from something that was previously approved in food services that is now going to be covered by an ESSER grant to the capital outlay category to cover the cost of the new South High relocatable buildings that are being uh, installed, and I believe that's on your consent agenda tonight as well. Uh, the other part of the adjustments is to make some redeployments uh, between categories requested by our instructional supervisors and directors. Uh, if you approve of these tonight, we will take them to the commissioners for their approval. Uh, and uh, these have been discussed previously. Thank you, Mr. Brandenburg. <coughs> Is there a motion? President Williams, I move to approve the proposed FY 2021 budget adjustments as presented. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Any questions for Mr. Brandenburg? Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to the vote. We're voting to approve the proposed fiscal year 2021 budget adjustments as presented this evening. All those in favor? All right, we're unanimous with the student member concurring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brandenburg. Next item of new business is this evening's consent agenda with Mr. Scott Bakel, Supervisor of Purchasing Presenting. Good evening, Mr. Bakel. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Michael. Tonight I have 19 items for your review. These items were reviewed by our Purchasing Review Committee and are being recommended for approval and staff is available if you have any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Bakel. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the awards, renewals, and procurements for building automation, energy management, and automated temperature control, annual maintenance extension to Control System Inc. at a cost of $228,500. Unit price contract for nursing and special education service providers, 
renewal to various vendors at the unit prices listed. Frontline software modules renewal to frontline education at a three-year total of $592,340.30. Fire alarm replacement at Smithsburg Middle School to Free State Baltimore LLC at a cost of $335,300. Maintenance and operations work order system renewal to Dude Solutions Inc. at a cost of $70,256.22. Professional design services athletic field track improvements at Smithsburg High School to Whitney Bailey Cox and McNanny LLC at a cost of $93,280. Trash and Recycling Removal Services Renewal to Republic Services at the unit prices listed. College and Career Readiness Software and Training Renewal to Naviance Inc. at a cost not to exceed a five-year total of $560,000.02. New Modular Classrooms and Relocation of 11 Modular Classroom Buildings to Milton Stamper Builders at a cost of $663,000. Chromebooks to CDWG at a cost of $1,023,000. Chromebook cases to CDWG at a cost of $197,375. Audiovisual equipment to Nicholas P. Papino Associates, Inc. at a cost not to exceed $169,200. Microsoft licenses renewal to Bell Technologics at a cost of $519,781.21. Juniper su Service Support and Licensing renewal to Skyline Technology Solution at a cost of $103,129. Google Workspace for Education Plus Subscription renewal to Amplified IT at a cost of $96,000. EnviroCleanse replacement air cartridge filters to Timelon Corporation at a cost of $239,960. Goldbook Pathways and Toolkit renewal to Enome Inc. at a cost of $268,250. Diagnostic and Interim Student Assessments renewal to CenterPoint Education Solutions at a cost of $288,227.75. And professional design services, new and existing Washington County Technical High School programs to Smolin Emmer Ikovich Architects at a cost of $419,374.99. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Any questions for Mr. Bakedal? Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Evans. Do you have a couple questions about some of these items? That's obviously quite a bit of money to be spending. So, just want to be clear on the purpose for some of this. The uh, for this second one, the uh, nursing and special ed service is that something that's required as part of the students' IEPs? So that's an on-call, basically an as-needed contract. Um, we hire, you know, our own nurses and and speech therapists, but there are times when um, staff is out for medical reasons, or they're just not able to fill a vacancy. This would allow them to reach out to these companies um, for, you know, a day, a week, uh, a part of a year, you know, if, if it's a medical, you know, a few weeks or whatever, and allow them to to attempt to get the services. Typically, you know, there's not necessarily, you know, nursing right now obviously is probably a shortage, so there's not a room full of nurses that they have sitting there, but they do have access to, um, to um, networks of nurses that they can to hire for us and they can come in and, and fill in that position or a speech therapist or a PT or, you know, the different disciplines. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then the next one for the frontline service uh, software modules, uh, I noticed that the cost continually increases each year. Uh, the you know, CSI, Control System Inc., they've kept their prices the same for a decade. Uh, is there something that we can negotiate to kind of keep that price a little more static? So, you know, that it's kind of two different 
things. The, the CSI is technicians coming in and doing work. Um, you know, there is some programming and some things like that. The, the, the front line is more of software as a service. So it's a, it's a subscription to their software. You know, we found most software companies have annual increases. And there is typically, you know, we were able to mitigate it some by asking them to, if we did a three-year extension, um, over the last two years, they told me that their um, increase has been a, around 4.85%. And they see over, they anticipate anywhere from a 45 to a 7% increase yearly, you know, in the foreseeable future. So we were able to mitigate some of that by locking in a little longer term. I think it's a three and a half the first year and then four the second and third. Um, you know, we could look at going with a different software, but then you're going to have the initial cost of that software, the... Um, the learning curve of that software, and then you're honestly going to have that same sort of situation where, you know, once once you've set in with that company, then they're they're looking to, you know, make those increases. You know, they're looking to make updates and they're looking to make their software better. You know, is typically what I hear whenever I ask them. You know, what's driving those increases? And you know, they they say they're continually trying to improve their software to be more user friendly, and but it it is the nature of the beast, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, can, can I just, since we're on the topic of frontline, is is this, I remember from HR committee, is this, are we also getting enhancements, additional um, uh, a functionality for this program with this with this purchase? Uh, I think Terry. Yes, Rod. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, Rod. We have a professional <laughs> learning management piece that is the professional development piece that you saw in the committee and then the evaluation piece that you saw and there's a new part that connects the two. Got it, so we're spending a little bit more but we're getting, sounds like a lot more. Correct. Okay, got it, thank you. Thank you. Um, for item number seven, the uh, trash and recycling removal, uh, would it be better to lock in that four year price rather than do an uh, uh, option for an additional two years? Is there? Something we could do to lock that in or not? So typically, we when we set that up, we did a, a two-year with two two-year renewals. Um, you know, the the contract actually allows them yearly to reevaluate their pricing. Mm -hmm. So we're locking in that price for this year. We are locking in the agreement for two. Okay, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, it, and it does make sense. Um, for item number eight, the college and career readiness. Uh, who uses that? How's how does that work? I, I'm guessing guidance counselors and seniors, or yeah, guidance counselors. I know use it. I think Helen will. School counselors use that program from grade six through twelve, and then we're also embedding it in different parts of our curriculum, and we're going to continue working on that over the next five years. Do you mind repeating that? I couldn't quite hear. Oh, I'm sorry. No it's problem. used by school counselors currently in grades 6 through 12. And then we're looking at um, working collaboratively with teachers across some of the curriculum and embedding in that over the next five years as well. And so just a quick follow-up to that. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's many people in this room that still wonder what they're going to be doing for the rest of their lives. So is... <laughs> You know, how to, for a sixth grader to start talking about college and career readiness, how, how does that part of the system work for them? Right, there's a lot of different components to the system. So it looks at strengths first. So it has a strengths explorer piece, it has an interest inventory piece, it has um, career um, globally, and then we also partner with some local agencies to be able to upload some videos of local agents' businesses um, for middle school students, and then in ninth. Through 12th grade, it's about goal setting, direction, really narrowing down uh, the career clusters that you looked at in middle school and examining that further through high school to plan for career and then college. Excellent. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. I You're appreciate welcome. that. Um, and then the next one, I'll, I'll end on this one for the Chromebooks. Uh, obviously, we just spent quite a bit of money making sure all the students had all this technology. Um, could you explain the uh, Chromebooks? Uh, how, how that purchase or how that decision came and then uh, the other one about the, now I, I think I was uh, told I was un misunderstanding that the carrying cases, are they carrying cases or protective cases that we're purchasing there? I'll let you answer that. 
Good evening, I'm Joe Allen, Executive Director of Technology, and I brought some props so you can see the case. <laughs> so this is a Chromebook in the case now. The case is not just a carrying case, it's also very much protective. It has hard sides. So when it's closed, it can be put, it doesn't fall out even though it's not zipped. It can also be put in a book bag. Often the kids will throw them, you know, things like that. This will protect it. If it's unprotected, we see hinges break, we see screens crack, and that type of thing. So this is $16. We would like to give one to each student, and it protects their, the, our investment in their device. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And then as far as how the decision came to get 3,000 Chromebooks, like I said, we just purchased, I'm sure, quite a few of these, and all the kids already have them. What, why do we need more now? It's a couple of reasons. W one is because the Chromebooks, um, they, last, they have a service life of about four to five years. So we've purchased Chromebooks. We have around 13,000 today. We've purchased them in two large lots, one of 2,000 and one of 11,500. If we don't start to replenish a little bit at a time and on a, on a sustainable regular pace, then what will happen is when the 11,500 expire in about four years, we'll have about a four and a half million dollar bill. So we're trying to replace that. That's really first reason. The second reason is there are more programs coming online. That first batch that we bought in 2017-18 school year, some of those are, are out of life already because they're damaged and things. So this is a resupply of that. So it's going to be every year you'll, you'll see me asking for about 3,000. This is the, the first of that. Okay. And that makes sense. I appreciate that. And then one quick follow-up to that. What are we doing with the old equipment that we're no longer going to be using? Do we sell that? Do we uh, trade it in? How does that work? Yeah, actually, so um, old equipment, I'll give you a great example. The iPads, we have some old I iPads that were downstairs in the storage area. They're sold to a group that buys assets, and we get we got a check for over $100,000 for selling them you know, a bunch of old iPads that are not useful to us anymore. So there's some salvage value to them. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And then one other one I forgot about, the uh, projectors. Uh, I, I certainly understand it. Is it more feasible to replace the light bulbs when they burn out, or should we go and purchase brand new projectors? So the projectors that we want to replace right now um, came out of warranty in, I think that the 2014 is the youngest of them. Some of them go back to 2011. So you can no longer purchase bulbs on the primary market. You have to buy them on aftermarket, which can be dangerous or hard to find. Uh, and in fact, the new, this lot here will have a bulb, but after that, we're gonna start to see laser projectors that no longer have bulbs. So bulbs will be a thing of the past shortly. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Bakun. Thank you, President Williams. I have a follow-up question regarding um, the... Wait, let me see here. One second. Yeah, the Chromebooks. Chromebooks. Students pay a $15 Chromebook insurance fee, so how is that factored into replacements and uh, warranty repairs? So today, students can opt in to pay a $15 fee, as you, as you said. It's called iCoverage, and what it offers them is a reduced uh, fee if the, the device is lost, stolen, or damaged. Um, so around $100,000 is collected each year in the $15 fees from all the students, and that is, like I said, used to, to offset the, uh, the cost of repairing devices. $100,000 used each year? Yes, we, we expend, uh, my records are over $300,000 over the past two years in, in, in repairs and lost devices. I know you mentioned that it, it gives them, what happens to students who break their device? Do they have to pay out of pocket for that? If, if a, a school administrator were to deem that the device was intentionally broken, then it becomes a disciplinary issue, and, but yes, they would be asked to pay for that. So how about unintentionally? Again, it would be at the discretion of the school administrator. If they felt that it was an accident, then it may be, you know, uh, supplemented by the school system. So um, what I'm getting is that if a student were to happen to break their device, they, I mean, according to the contract, they could be charged, but they usually do not get charged, correct? Like if it's by accident. I don't have any figures in front of me to say they usually do or do not. That's, I, I could get that if, if that's of interest, but that's uh, an administrator decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bakun. Any other questions? Okay, then we'll move to the vote. The motion is to approve the procurements, awards, and renewals as read by Mr. Bickford. All those in favor? We're unanimous with the student member concurring. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. We'll move now to the superintendent's report. Dr. Michael. Hey, thank you, Mrs. Williams, board members. Uh, to begin the superintendent's report tonight, I want to start with some celebrations of our IB students. Uh, Principal Welshire is with us this evening of North Hagerstown High School, and he's going to share uh, some certificates that the students have earned in the IB program. So, Mr. Elshire, when you get settled, we're ready for your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm honored to be here this evening on behalf of the class of 2021 at North Hagerstown High School and our international baccalaureate candidates for both our diploma program and our career-related program. The candidates are Emily Belke, Diamond Blackman, Samantha Briggs, Zachary Brooks, Jeremy Calcarian, Emmy Ericasima, Garrett Evans, Fiona Graves, Amy Hatcher, Logan Hine, Hayden Johnston, Catriel Kassian, Demetrius Keyes, Jonah Lewis, Ben Lindsay, Aiden Morningstar, Maya Murthy, Dahlia Mustafa, Elizabeth Norgard, Abigail Ohebu, Prutha Patel, Yusuf Kwam, Rachel Ramsey, Stephen Ryder, Peter Surface, Emily Slocum, Alex Tima Abanke, Andrea Trumbull, Samin Arouge, Eric Wang, and Shannon Wojcik. Our international baccalaureate candidates for our career-related program, Tiana Donaldson, Aliyah Ferguson, Raiden Kirshner, Jordan Nilabowski, Devere Reed, and Haley Stottlemyre. I'd like to congr congratulate all of our international baccalaureate candidates. Their work is incredible, and the things they do, and the staff does an incredible job with them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alshar. I know you're very, very proud of the IB students, as we are of our AP candidates that we have every year. We certainly want to recognize the incredible accomplishment our IB students have each year at North Hagerstown High School. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you. And thank you for sharing their success. Have a good evening. Okay, thank you. At this time, board members, I'd like to give you a little update on our plans for summer school for 2021. Uh, we have Drs. Willow, Akers, and Palmer with us tonight. And they're gonna share uh, a brief update uh, regarding our summer school plans. In the fall, we'll have our traditional uh, report of how summer school went, but just a little bit of the front end of, of what we anticipate happening. So, Good evening, Dr. Michael, President Williams, and members of the board. This evening, we would like to share some information about our upcoming summer school programs, both camps and tutoring for our students in Washington County Public Schools. So at the elementary level, we're offering tutoring and summer camps and these last about one to two week periods throughout the entire nine weeks of our summer. They're in each of our elementary schools. And our goal is to increase student readiness and to accelerate learning in the areas of literacy and or mathematics for each one of these opportunities. Transportation and food services will be provided for all students attending. Currently, we have approximately 286 high interest camps for our elementary students. And I say approximately because I feel like this number changes every day. We're either adding camps because we have so many students that want to participate, or in some cases we're removing a camp because maybe it wasn't as high interest as we thought it would be. So as noted on this slide, this was just a few of our variety. It includes things from STEM and coding to sports, creepy crawlies, photography, and cooking. So something definitely for everyone when you look at all the different opportunities with a tie-in to that literacy and mathematics in each one of these. 
Okay, our summer camp for middle school students, uh, rather than having a centralized summer school, each middle school is offering a variety of camps that run from June 14th to August 5th. Some camps are half days and some are full days. The camps run Monday through Thursday for one week or two weeks. The goal of the camps is to reinforce literacy and math skills in the context of high interest activities. Uh, we will be providing breakfast and lunch at those camps. Due to facilities projects, Smithsburg Middle School is holding its camps at Smithsburg Elementary and Western Heights Middle School is holding its camps at Jonathan Hager Elementary. All other schools are hosting their own camps. Here are some examples of the high interest camps middle schools are providing. Uh, I think there's something for everyone and probably several camps that would interest most students. So far, we have a little over 1,000 students signed up for at least one camp, and we have 151 camps being offered. In addition to summer camps, middle schools are providing tutoring in math and English language arts to some students to help them reach specific learning goals. Having in-person high school summer school this year uh, in an effort to overcome some of the problems that the pandemic presented to students and schools this year, we made some changes to high school summer school. The program has been decentralized and will run uh, for eight weeks instead of five weeks so that students can earn more than one credit, which in the past, that's typically all they could earn in summer school. Summer school is divided into two semesters and the days are divided into morning and afternoon classes. Due to uh, summer facilities projects, North Hagerstown High School Summer School will be held at Northern Middle School and Smithsburg High School Summer School will be held at Boonesboro High School. All other high schools, high schools will uh, host their own summer school. On average, high schools are offering 18 courses. We will also offer a limited number of courses through blended learning classes. Uh, Barbara Ingram uh, School for the Arts will not be hosting summer school, but will be hosting several arts related camps. We're very excited about the opportunity to be able to offer so many camps. Um, and I wanna thank our teachers, our administrators, our ESP staff. We put the proposal out uh, to many of them and said, what are the camps that we could bring, that we could offer this summer that would bring more students uh, into summer learning than what we've had historically? And our staff came up with many of these ideas, talking with students, uh, getting feedback from community and parents, and it's really a community effort coming together for summer school and summer programming. But instead of just taking our word for it, I think we have a short video of some students and some teachers and administrators that want to talk a little bit about our summer programming. The escape room camp. I'm pretty sure we're going to do like little. I'm really excited about the escape room camp. I'm pretty sure we're going to do like little challenges with lock boxes and we're going to have to like put all the clues together to get the answer for everything. They're still learning and they're still working on those major standards that we're working on in class, but it's in with a just a fun, refreshing twist. I'm signed up to the Western Heights camp, the Going for Gold summer camp, and the flag football. All my friends are really excited about this and they can't wait. 
So naturally, with everything that has occurred this year, we're just excited in general to be in the building. So to have an extended opportunity to be in the building together uh, to prepare for even next year is a really unique opportunity that we're all excited for. We have um, a handful of teachers that have not taught summer school in years, and they've come and told me how excited they are. Very few students have signed up for one camp. It's typically three, four, or more. We're going to have probably 100 to 150 children accessing resources during the summer. That's unheard of, so that's a tremendous win-win. Our investments in these programs this summer are going to be a great jumping off point for us in the future summers as well as during our school years. This is a chance for us to capture kids, their interest, build relationships with them to make sure kids are really prepared to have a great school year in 21-22. As many students as we have enrolled in these summer camps for the number of weeks, we're going to continue to see really excellent growth. That's exciting. I'm sure the team would be glad to answer any questions the board members might have, and we'll have a lot of follow-up, um, you know, I'm sure in the fall as well. Mr. Stauffer? I was just wondering, uh, probably logistics reasons, but why some of the camps are being held, like Smithsburg High School Summer School will be held at Boone's Bar High School, things like that. Yeah, so they have uh, specific projects uh, going on at those schools that make it impossible, like for right. Smith, oh, okay. Smithburg High School has the HVAC project. I think we're doing that across two summers, so <clears throat> it, it won't be available for them to participate there. there would be logistics, something yeah. Yeah. Mr. Gaston? Uh, yes, just a question for parents and um, students out there that would be interested in signing up. How, how does a parent, a grandparent, sign up their student um, or students for different schools, is, is there transportation or do they have to make transportation for themselves? Yes, there will be transportation. We're using depot stops. Uh, they can contact their school to sign up. Schools have registrations uh, that they can do online or they can email the school or, or call the school and get signed up. Some of the camps are full, but, but uh, many of them are not. And uh, when there's openings at other schools, if, if they can provide their own transportation, then they can go to camps at, at different schools. Uh, but if they want transportation, they have to attend one of the camps in their own school. Is there any cost to these, these camps? No, no, these camps are free to the students. Thank you. Mrs. Murray? Dr. Volo, can you speak a little bit about what um, students like the ones at Marshall Street can expect for ESY extended school year? Yes, so we have offered uh, extended school year like we would at any typical summer. But this year at Marshall Street, we are, we are excited to announce that we are expanding that to students that have not qualified for extended school year. In addition, um, we are working uh, with some community partners on a work-based learning opportunity uh, that more details will be coming home on here in the, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, we also have, uh, for other students, we have a connections camp, a rise step camp, for both elementary and secondary. We're also offering uh, camps for, or a program for our summit program students as well. So we feel like uh, there are a lot of different options out there in addition to the traditional things that we've been able to offer in the past, uh, but using our funding from ESSER, this was a, we were able to actually go uh, well beyond and offer additional things this year, such as the tutoring and the camp concept. Thank you. Mr. Bacoon? Thank you, President Williams. Uh, Dr. Willow, do the summer camps uh, include uh, original credit opportunities, such as like taking phys ed, art, or is that not included within the? So at the high school level, we do have original credit opportunities. Typically, you're right, uh, physical education, health, foundations of technology tend to be our more popular ones for students that are trying to get ahead and have opportunities to take additional classes in their schedule during the school year. Just like talking about those original credit opportunities, I know, I've, I know I personally had the opportunity to take phys ed and help over the summer and before school, and those were amazing, really allowed me to free up my schedule. And then following up with that, uh, programs like these, like there are programs that you wish like you did whenever, like looking back, and some people just sometimes don't have access to information. So what has been done to promote these programs? 
to students and families. So many of our schools have sent, using the Blackboard Connect, have sent emails home uh, to parents. They've done uh, different, uh, using our different promotion or programs, we've promoted it on our website. In addition, uh, we rely on our teachers, our counselors. Sometimes word of mouth is still our best uh, approach. I think when you look at the middle school camps and you look at the high enrollment there, um, it's in part due to our teachers sharing all these wonderful opportunities with students, getting excited, getting their friends excited. So not only uh, do we have our traditional email, Blackboard website, but we're also, you know, talking about these opportunities with students during the day. Thank you. Dr. Willow, you, um, Mr. A I'm sorry, Dr. Akers mentioned um, the high school summer school programs offering AP courses, blended learning courses, and uh, Mr. Bakum addressed the issue of students wanting to take classes to, to get ahead. What about credit recovery? Is that something that's being addressed in summer school or no? Yes, as uh, Dr. Akers referred to in his slide, uh, we have a two semester program at our high schools that allow for credit repeat. Um, for those students that uh, need additional time uh, to go back and, and correct mistakes and have the opportunity to earn a credit. Um, they're long days. Uh, you know, it, it, is, it is not something that's, it, it is not something that a student, we don't, we don't give away credits. It is something that the student has to earn by attending and putting in the time and the effort. Uh, but students have the opportunity to earn up to four repeat credits this summer if they attend the entire time. And if I could just add that, that we, we see recovery and repeat are two different things. Uh, students can recover a, a one marking period grade. So if a student failed because it's a fourth marking period, they needed a 63 and they earned a 53, then they can do recovery that's outside of summer school at their own school with their teacher of record, the teacher they just had. So they can extend their year uh, and do the additional work needed to improve that marking period grade. So that would be in addition to the repeat that's available during summer school. So I just want to make sure we understand the difference, recovery and repeat. Thank you, Dr. Akers, for making that distinction. I appreciate that very much. Um, you know, I think we're all concerned about, about the toll that um, the pandemic has taken on student learning. And um, in particular, our most vulnerable learning. I think of our free and reduced meal students, our special ed students, our English language learners. Um, Mr. Gesford's question was about how parents could enroll their students. What are we doing to, as far as an outreach to get to these students who are the ones that will have the significant gaps as a result of the learning loss. Well, I think in part that's, as we know, as you know, we look at our data internally. It's about building those relationships with students, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, through our counselors, through our student intervention specialists, through our assistant principals, our principals, our SST teams are inviting, calling parents, inviting parents in to talk about those recovery, repeat options, or maybe it's one-on-one -on -one tutoring for the student that could benefit from having additional help and support, but doesn't necessarily need to take a additional course. So I think it's gonna look different depending on the needs of the student. And that's why I think with the programs we've designed, they're flexible in ways to capture, uh, you know, the students and put them in the opportunities that they need in order to be successful. Well, I think you have a, a wide range of opportunities, especially at the elementary level and certainly very, um, very attractive offerings and things that would would pique one's interest um, so my hope is that it's just not a flyer going home that there is an, a, a sincere and i don't doubt that there would be a sincere effort to reach out to those students and make them aware of the opportunities that we have for them this summer so. We've been on uh, already advertised in our summer school and, and have a significant number of students already signing up. And like staff mentioned, they're making adjustments as necessary. Uh, we've also have been uh, conducting a variety of formative assessments, uh, meaning instruction that would, or assessments that would inform our instruction 
here at the end of the year in both reading and math, and some of that will be used to guide some of the students at summer school. Part of the federal requirement is that we have a uh, baseline information and growth from our summer school efforts, so all that's being incorporated uh, in many of these uh, programs that were just mentioned. Uh, the camp concept, for the most part, is, uh, is available to us, as Dr. Willow mentioned, as a result of uh, COVID money, ESSER money, uh, CARES money, um, those programs. We normally spend about a million dollars on uh, summer school. It's difficult to say at this point what our summer school bill will be, but we've kind of dedicated as much as $5 million to summer school. Uh, normally we would not be able to do that, but we're hoping we're able to do that over the next couple summers and maybe build some interest for these camps. The camp is obviously the hook uh, of high interest, and as mentioned in the video, you know, while we have the students, we certainly hope to grow their skill set uh, in a variety of subject areas as well as uh, the area of interest. And President Williams, typically for middle school alone, which is a little further along in the enrollment process, we average about 180 students a, a year uh, on average for middle school. We're, as Dr. Ager shared, we're at 1,000 as of now, and our enrollment is still climbing. So I feel um, confident that our, you know, our principals, our assistant principals, our teachers, our counselors, our ESP staff are all working together to get as many students uh, the opportunity to be successful this summer. And that's what's exciting because this really is a team effort. Thank you, Dr. Willow, for your efforts. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you and, Thanks. and thank you to staff, uh, all staff, teachers, and people who've had ideas, ESP administrators, and our leadership team for pulling together a pretty unique summer school opportunity. Uh, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, maybe before I go on with my report, I do just want to mention a comment was made earlier in citizen participation about the elementary school starting a half an hour earlier uh, if the board was, chose to close Hancock Middle Senior High School. That, that information is not correct. I think there was some type of discussion about that during the FIAC committee. Uh, I think we made it clear in the superintendent's report at this point we wouldn't anticipate any changes to the elementary, Hancock Elementary time schedule. In fact, with the additional buses for the secondary school, um, we'd anticipate that we'd also have those buses help with elementary runs, and we might be able to shorten some of the times for some of the elementary students uh, that currently attend there. That information can all be found in the superintendent's report. Copies of those booklets are available at all the schools, uh, Hancock uh, Elementary, Hancock Middle Senior High School, Cascade, Old Forge, Smithburg, uh, Clear Spring High, Clear Spring Middle as well as all that information can be found on the web, including the very detailed chart uh, regarding transportation that's all been very carefully uh, calculated and run uh, since the FIAC report. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, announce a little celebration. Our ESP of the year finalists uh, were announced today. I had a great opportunity. We had a great morning as we jumped around five different places and I uh, got the opportunity to very much surprise five of our ESP employees that are finalists. I think we have pictures up here tonight. They're up on my Facebook page. Uh, Deborah Plume, uh, Western Heights uh, Secretary. I believe she's retiring this year. She served there at uh, Western Heights for many years. She was uh, very excited to, uh, to be acknowledged. And our special education department is a pair pro at North High, uh, Diane. Uh, Novicki, uh, again, she was working away, uh, had her back to us when we entered the room. We kind of snuck up on her and uh, very, very pleased to acknowledge her as one of our finalists, another outstanding ESP employee. Uh, a bus driver for this year, uh, Christy Clements, uh, again, bus driver, uh, her aide that's on her bus with her, I think may have been the person that nominated her. He was tailing along. He knew what was coming, uh, and so it was kind of exciting uh, to, to uh, share with her that she was a finalist. Uh, Crystal Tobry, down at Boonesboro uh, Middle School and High School. Uh, she's the kitchen manager uh, there, just an excellent candidate. Again, her whole staff cheered her as we uh, unveiled what was happening, and uh, she's going to well represent our food and nutrition service staff as one of our finalists. And finally, Scott Canfield. Uh, works here in the mail, uh, clerk here at CES, and uh, Scott, another deserving uh, ESP recognition for finalists. So we look forward to June 9th 
at 5 o'clock here at CES, very similar to our Teacher of the Year announcements. We'll have our five uh, finalists here, and one of them will be our ESP uh, of the Year uh, winner. So I look forward to June 9th in just a couple of weeks. We'll celebrate right here in this room. Uh, I just did want to say to the public, uh, certainly a lot of confusion anytime we get information from the federal, state, uh, local levels. School systems are caught in the middle trying to sort all that information out. Governor Hogan made an announcement on Thursday and came back out on Friday and made another announcement. In that announcement on Friday, he did clarify that some of the things he was describing or mentioning were not applicable to schools. So I uh, appreciate our COVID response team, Janice House, um, Jeff Prue, for continuing to follow up. Uh, we've been in contact with our local health department trying to sort through all these all this information at this time we don't have any changes to schools as far as mass social distancing we are fortunate that our metrics have declined substantially over the last week and we're very grateful for that now at this point in secondary schools students can be within three feet uh, except at lunchtime uh, and students need to remain masked as well as the elementary school can be at three feet however if there is a case of covid uh, non-vaccinated students and staff would still need to be quarantined if they're inside of six feet. Uh, so that's something we need to continue to follow. Uh, and we'll certainly keep the community updated as we get additional information or clarity from either the State Department, Maryland Health Department, our local health department, or additional executive orders from the governor or from wherever else. Uh, a big announcement somewhat related to that. Um, we decided that we're going to expand our graduation opportunities. So instead of four tickets for graduation, I'm hoping we're making quite a few people happy tonight as we announce that there'll be eight tickets available for each of our graduates at each of our uh, high schools and our, and our ceremonies coming up. So graduation is a once in a lifetime event. It'll kind of be special that we'll have that many people on campus. Uh, again, we'll be announcing more information regarding that uh, as we get closer and through individual meetings with seniors and parents directly from individual schools. Along with that announcement of going from four tickets to eight tickets, another significant announcement is we're moving from daytime graduation to evening graduation. So originally we had planned for daytime graduation. Our thought process there uh, was that graduation was going to be a very small event. We weren't certain at the time when we planned graduation where it might not even be just students and or small groups of students and parents. Uh, as things have evolved here with executive orders, uh, we've decided to flip graduation to an evening where we traditionally have had it for a number of years. The schools are going to continue to primarily do the graduations outside. So graduations will move to Tuesday, June 1st, the same day, but will move to 7 p.m at the stadiums for Boonesboro High School seniors, Clear Spring seniors, Hancock seniors, North High seniors, Smithburg, South, and Williamsport seniors will all be June 1st, 7 p.m. in their respective stadiums. If we have inclement weather, we'll do our best to hold off as late as possible to try to make a good decision, but probably by about five o'clock that evening, uh, we'll check all our available forecasts, radar, those types of things. And if graduations need to be postponed, they'll move to immediately the next night. They'll move from June 1st to June 2nd at the same time. For Tech High, uh, Tech High is going to move to Wednesday, June 2nd, as its scheduled date, 7 o'clock at the South High Stadium. That's June 2nd for Tech High. That'll allow Tech High students to attend both their homeschool graduations as well as the Tech High graduations. If South High were to get rained out on Tuesday, South would move to Wednesday, Tech would move to Thursday. And that information will be further explained to Tech High students uh, as we have meetings with our seniors. Barbara Ingram, in order to accommodate some families that also have students at a variety of schools, uh, they're going to be inside the ARC. This was a decision made by Barbara Ingram some time ago. They're the only school that's taken advantage of HCC's new air conditioning. Uh, at the ARC. They will be at 5.30 on June 1st. So they're moving to later, 5.30. Uh, we're hoping that'll help accommodate some parents that have students graduating at a couple different schools as a result of the unique opportunities there at Barbara Ingram. 
Marshall Street will remain through its, its daytime graduation at 10 o'clock on June 1st. So its time doesn't change. We historically have always had Marshall Street graduation uh, in the daytime, and it'll be held there in their courtyards, and none of their plans have changed. As well as Antietam Academy will remain at 6.30 on Thursday, May 27th. Again, if they get rained out, it will just keep getting pushed today. Um, and uh, information will be shared with students if we start to run into the weekend, what would happen there. So again, I'm excited to announce uh, that we moved from four tickets to eight tickets. Uh, I know there's some concern here for staff to be able to attend. Uh, so one of the accommodations with this, staff would be able to attend uh, voluntarily to come that evening uh, to be part of the graduation ceremonies. Another change that will occur for that day, instead of being a virtual day for high school students on June 1st, that now will be an in-person day. So a normal uh, traditional school day uh, following Memorial Day for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of that week uh, for elementary, uh, middle, and underclassmen at the high school level, as well as a half day uh, on the following Monday. Uh, other activities that we uh, have planned we will continue to do primarily outside uh, in much smaller venues, uh, not with eight um, tickets unless it's a very small uh, ceremony of some type, and that's elementary, middle, and high school, and that information would come out directly from schools. So pleased to make that announcement. I know for some it'll be welcome news, particularly the four tickets to eight tickets. For others, it might be with some type of a challenge of some type moving from daytime to evening but we think this is the best uh, move at this time to accommodate the larger crowd, to accommodate uh, people that are working during the day because suddenly four more people are gonna be allowed to come to graduation. It'll be thousands of people effective and they might not be able to get off work and things like that. So hopefully this will be a, a, good, uh, a good outcome for our seniors, our staff, and our parents as we celebrate a big day. And with that in mind, I certainly wanna congratulate our seniors uh, this is our last board meeting, um, somewhat prior to graduation. Our board meeting, I think there'll be an announcement about our board meeting changing, but I don't think any of our seniors are going to be here now on June 1st. Um, so I do want to take this opportunity to wish them the very best of luck in their future. We appreciate their patience and efforts uh, to survive the pandemic. I'm sure none of them pictured the end of their junior year or their senior year to be like this. Uh, so we appreciate them persevering, uh, their commitment to their academic studies, and surviving through this adversity. And again, just we are so grateful that we were able to bring students back for part of third marking period and all fourth marking period, have sports, which I've had the opportunity to attend in many places. Uh, it's just great to see our students back on campus. But again, to our seniors, I wish you the very, very best of luck. I'll probably make comments again on June 1st, but at that point, we'll be a few minutes away from graduation, I hope. And uh, WCPS is so proud of our seniors, and, and again, we wish them all good luck. I think that is all my comments for this evening. The information I just shared uh, about graduation is in a s'more, our newsletter format. And if that hasn't been released to the public, it will be released here in the next couple minutes. And if you have questions regarding graduation, I encourage you to contact your local principal. Um, this is fairly new information for them, so they'll have some details to work out, um, but I'm sure they can respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michaels. At this time, we'll move to personnel actions. Dr. Pugh. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Michael, before you today, you have a number of staff changes as discussed in closed session for your consideration. This time I ask for your approval of the um, staff changes. Thank you, Dr. Pugh, is there a motion? President Williams, I move to approve the personnel actions that we discussed earlier in closed session. Thank you, Mrs. Murray, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Zettmeyer. Any questions, discussion? All those in favor of approval of the personnel actions as discussed earlier this afternoon? All right, we have unanimous approval. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Mrs. Williams, if I might, we generally note uh, principal moves. There is one principal move on tonight's agenda. I don't have my list with me, so I hope I'm accurate saying one principal tonight. 
Uh, Dr. Terry Williamson is going to be accepting a new position with us at Bester Elementary, be kind of a co-principal, a new design for Washington County Public Schools. And um, so we're excited about that, that uh, new adventure for her and for Bester Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. We'll move now to reports to the board. We'll have board member committee reports. Mr. Evans, would you like to begin, please? Yeah, we do not have any at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gessford, facilities? Facilities has nothing to report. Thank you. Mr. Bickford, policy review and development? Policy will we'll meet on Tuesday, May 25th at 1130. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Mrs. Murray, human resources? HR has nothing to report, President Williams. Thank you. Dr. Zentmeyer, curriculum and instruction? Curriculum and instruction consider both school net and um, gold book renewals, secondary math and science resources, and the launch of our new Academy of Blended Learning Education, ABLE, which is so exciting for students who flourish on a virtual platform. Our next meeting is June 14th at 3 p.m. here. Thank you, Dr. Zentmeyer. Is there so, do you have anything about student government to announce? Yes, I do, President Williams. The Washington County Association of Student Councils, the student council organization for the county met May 12th at 6.30 p.m. During this meeting, there's topics discussed on listening, communicating, and being an effective leader. In addition to that general assembly, the small elections for the small elections were also conducted and the next small for Washington County will be Tanish Gupta, an 11th grader at Washington, sorry, 11th grader at North Hagerstown High School. So I give my congratulations to him, and I have full faith that he will carry and execute this role well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bakum. Okay, that concludes our reports. Under miscellaneous business, we have one item, and that is our future agenda items list. We should have received in your packet. We have coming up on um, June 1st, and at this time it might be good to mention that there will be a change in the time of the board's business meeting. The business meeting on June 1st will be at 4 p.m. and not the usual 6 p.m. Um, on June 1st, we are going to postpone what we had scheduled, I believe. We had a... Um, report on the progress of the implementation of the educational equity policy and action plan. I think it was decided earlier that we would postpone that. So on June 15th, we have the district committee on assessment recommendations coming up. And um, I think that's about as far out as we can go for right now. Also on June 15th, we have a vote that we'll be taking as a board um, on the superintendent's recommendation regarding the closing of Hancock Middle Senior High School and Cascade Elementary School. So that's all I have for future agenda items. Should you have a suggestion for an agenda item, please let a member of the agenda planning committee know. We'll move now to board member comments. Mr. Evans, would you like to begin down there? Yeah, the only thing I'd like to say is uh, I noticed uh, as I drive by, we see the lights on at uh, this the former Sun Stadium, Hagerstown Municipal Stadium. Great to see that field being used by our very own. Uh, and I was actually at a game, uh, I think last week it was. Uh, hopefully we're able to keep that building or that that facility maintained and uh, keep it for use for the community here. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Gasford. I don't have anything this evening. Mr. Pickford. Nothing for me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Trasper. Just want to congratulate the five ESP finalists. Be interested to see who will be the recipient of that award. Thank you, Mr. Trasper. Dr. Zetmeyer. Two weeks from just about now, our seniors are embarking on a great adventure. 
No more dress rehearsals. No safety nets. In fact, some of the jobs that they will have don't yet exist. So hopefully, we have taught them that life, when it works correctly, <laughs> is a balancing act. And in that balancing act, there is a center of gravity that they have to embrace. So, after we've taught them that life is a balancing act, and they know where their center of gravity is, then when faced with impossible odds, they can come up with possibilities. Congratulations, seniors, and thanks to the parents, teachers, and staff that made this a possibility. Your turn. Oh, I have to follow Thank that. Thank you, Dr. Gentire. <laughs> Mrs. Murray? I just want to say congratulations to the five ESP finalists. They're all wonderful people and do great things in their jobs, and I wish them all well. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Mr. Bakum. I just want to concur with Ms. Murray's statements. Congratulations to all the ESP finalists. I also want to extend a hand to seniors. Seniors have went through incredible trying times that we have not seen for over a century. Having their junior year online, and then also having dealing with, with senior exams, um, AP exams, various IAs and ID and stuff. Seniors have really gone through something that we can't even comprehend, and I send them a great hand of applause and congratulations. We finally made it. I also just want to take a time to um, just talk. Um, students generally, as they graduate, they're put in a precarious position. As their fountain of youth drains, it becomes inevitable that they're no longer students. But one thing is certain, our WCPS seniors, they have the fire and passion to lead within all their careers and future endeavors. So I just want to extend to WCPS seniors, I just want to extend a question to WCPS seniors. What will be your legacy? What will you leave behind? And what will you continue? Just think about that and think about what you'll do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bakum. I'd like to offer congratulations to Tanish Gupta on his election as the student representative to the Washington County Board of Education. I echo the congratulations to our ESP finalists and a big, big congratulations to our seniors. Go out and make it happen. Any, anyone else have any final words before we adjourn? No. Thank you for a great day of meetings. We stand adjourned. <laughs>